that's what everyone's looking for. Like passive income is look on the internet, every ad that's basically work from home, make passive income, et cetera. It's all a myth except for real estate. And then we, even within real estate, there's a lot of verticals. It's very challenging to, to do, but not only is it passive, the predictability of outcome is very high. Mm -hmm. If you know how to pinpoint recession resistant opportunities that are going to perform in all stages of the cycle. I am Christina Suter, and this is the real estate breakthrough show where we talk about the reality of real estate the mindset you need in order to face the reality of what it is and tips and tricks to get you moving forward in investing. I am your host, Christina Suter. Hey, this is Christina Suter with the Real Estate Breakthrough Show. I have Hunter Thompson with me and I am excited to bring you Hunter. I've actually known Hunter as an associate in the real estate sort of networks that we belong to for, I think we've established now almost 10 years. A decade. And uh, it's been amazing to watch him truly grow into this level of professionalism that he is going to talk about today. So let me read a little bit about his bio so that you guys get a sense for his background, uh, but also some other things. Let's see, let me get to his bio first. So you can find his bio on LinkedIn in case anybody cares, right? So ASIM Capital, Hunter Thompson, he is the managing principal at ASIM Capital and having a background in economics has allowed me to achieve a holistic approach to analyzing real estate data and has led me to a unique perspective on out-of-state investing. The goal of my business is to help clients invest in passive cash flow opportunities that provide a healthy return on investment without the headaches associated with the stock market volatility. Anybody else tired of stock market volatility and gambling, the gambling of the stock market? Not that I have anything against the stock market. No, not at all. Um, I have analyzed and closed residential real estate acquisitions, hard money loans, bridge financing opportunities, commercial and residential syndications, mobile home parks, retail opportunities, and syndicated office space investments. Yes, that is a long list. He's been at this, I said, 10 years. I have worked with multiple asset teams across several geographic locations in the US and Canada. My main priority is establishing an extremely diverse portfolio without exposing clients' capital to unnecessary risk. Securities offered through the, oh, you don't need that one. All right, I was gonna need your disclaimer. So right. I really am, it's just like you now have gone from being a syndication capital raiser to where you actually have written a book about it, right? Raising capital for real estate. You also have moved on to actually having a full on training course and being able to help people move into it. I can't tell you, Hunter, how many times people have come to me and gone, well, Christina, I don't have any money in, in order to start with real estate, but I have maybe a network or they're like, I don't even know where to start and I don't have money. And I'm like, well, your network is the place to start because raising capital is about establishing a trusted identity where people like you and know you and trust you in the real estate field. And you, it's good if you're a real estate expert as you've established yourself to be, but also it's really being exposed, right? Being willing to be a leader in the field, being willing to stand out, being willing to gain knowledge, to put yourself on the front lines. And all of that seems, and the reason why I'm laying all this out is because Hunter, this is what I've observed about you right, is that you've embraced each and every one of these leadership qualities. And I think that's part of what's in your coursework. So let's get to that in a minute, because I'm going to backtrack, if I may, all the way to, so how did you get started in real estate? The basic question. Yeah, I appreciate the intro. Um, you know, I was very fortunate in terms of a lot of things. Just generally speaking, I graduated college right when the 2008 crisis was taking place and unfolding. And that was very fortunate for someone like myself, who is very much inclined to go left when people are looking right. That was like the mother of all opportunities from an asset price deflation type of situation. <clears throat> and so I saw that opportunity, especially since I moved to California at the time, not necessarily to pursue real estate, just because I felt like that's where opportunities were. And I very quickly started to recognize how historically significant the moment in which I was living was. I started to go to networking events where people were pretty distraught. There was distress yeah. in the marketplace, not only from a pricing standpoint, but from an emotional standpoint. And when I started to build my real estate network, just kind of going to networking events in person and such, very fortunate, not only in terms of the timing of the market, but that timing and that price deflation, especially in California, again, it led me to be able to network with some very savvy, sophisticated individuals. The market acted as a big filter for bad ideas. 
And so, yes. well stated. Keep going. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you, but yes. Yeah, when, well I, when I, yeah. I mean, the first couple of people that I met and that I really latched onto were extremely influential uh, people in the sector and in, especially in the state of California. Mm -hmm. And their strategies were strategies that were positioned to weather that storm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, for some of the first investments I ever made were in very quality multi property tenants, meaning. Uh, I mean, multi-tenant properties, so multi-family, self-storage, mobile home parks, et cetera, somewhere between five, 10 to sometimes $50 million assets. Mm -hmm. And when I uncovered that you could be a limited partner investor, a passive investor, I just, the whole world changed. It was kind of like everyone's around the world talking about how can you achieve passive income? It's basically a myth, except for when it comes to real estate in the passive syndicated approach to investing. And so right. I uncover that and that's, my life has not been the same since. You know, Hunter, you just said it so well, so succinctly from my point of view, right? I mean, I've been investing for 30 years and as I, there's a, there's a skill set that you develop over 30 years, but there's an awareness of the dynamics of how the field works, right? Whether it's medical, whether it's real estate, whether it's horse trading, right? There's a, there's a nuance to how the field works. And I think you're right. There is a myth called, oh, real estate is a passive investment product. It's like, no, not really. Uh, really, because I've, I've owned directly. I've flipped. I've done an apartment complex conversion to condos. I have done lot splits. I have done rehabs on large homes and small homes. I have owned single family and multifamily rental units. I've, a hard, I've been a hard money lender, right? And I've invested in syndications. And honestly, the difference between flipping or even uh, even owning units, multi-units, even with a property management company in place, the only ones I've truly found to be passive are hard money lending, where I have where I'm not tracking a construction project, right? So it's hard money lending on an, on a non-construction item, right? It can be almost any asset, but it's a hard money against it and syndications. And as I get older in investing in real estate and I move further and further into, you know, I'm done with flips. I'm done with the act, with the active day-to-day -day push. I'm ready to be much more passive. I'm like, yeah, there's only a few assets. I want to, two, few, I call them pathways, ways to invest that I care about because it's asset agnostic. And I think that's important that people understand it's asset agnostic. If I'm using a syndication platform or if I'm doing hard money lending, it's kind of agnostic to what asset I'm doing that with, as long as I'm doing a really good job vetting the syndicator, the one who's actually running, right? Running the investment and or understanding the state of the investment itself, if it's gonna be hard money. And I still have to truly understand the syndicator or the one that is running the project. And I don't think everybody understands that. I don't, I think that's a nuance that gets missed. Yeah, passive real estate investing. I can do passive real estate investing. I can own a couple of rentals while I'm, you know, while I'm working a job. Yeah, you totally can. But change that to 20 rentals, change that to a 20 unit apartment building. It's a different, it becomes a different animal. So I completely agree. I mean, not only in the real estate sector, but I mean, that's what everyone's looking for. Like passive income is look on the internet, every ad that's basically work from home, make passive income, et cetera. It's all a myth except for real estate. And then we, even within real estate, there's a lot of verticals that's very challenging to, to do, but not only is it passive, the predictability of outcome is very high. Mm -hmm. If you know how to pinpoint recession resistant opportunities that are going to perform in all stages of the cycle. And so, you know, going back to that, that story of mine, my thesis was formed in the wake of the great recession. And mm -hmm. it was very clear if I could identify product types and property types that were going to perform during 2008, they're going to perform in 2006. They're going to perform in 2002. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but you'd have to give up some of the upside, which I was very willing to do. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of the other side of, you know, hotels, development, land entitlement on the other side of that is things like the mobile home park business where you don't even own the property, right? You own the lot and the tenants own the yeah. The, the, um, the homes the home. and the homes are positioned on the lot and the rental checks come in uh, pretty passively. But then even if they don't, you have a manager that's there to kind of administer all of that. So the passive investors don't even get contacted other than, hey, where's the ACH information so we can send you your money. So it sounds like an infomercial if you're not already in the scene, which by the way, in 2010 or 11, there weren't a lot of people in the scene. But I, like I said, very fortunate in terms of the timing and 
I started, uh, you know, investing in that manner and then later started raising capital for those types of deals. And we went from, you know, struggling on my first capital raise, which we can talk about to now I've raised, you know, almost $50 million from accredited investors and all over the country. Yes. And, and, um, you know, it's hard because I want to ask you so many different questions in so many different directions. So um, let's start with, let's stay with the side of raising $50 million. And you truly have, I mean, yes, you didn't do your first, your first raise was tough, which I expect everybody has a tough experience. And we will, we, I, you know, as, as you know, it's part of the format of the show is to share your tough experience because as successful as real estate can make you, it is also a, oh, I can, um, I'm trying to think about it. It's, it's, I don't know. It's it's a it's a it's a tough master, right? Being able to master real estate takes a certain amount of determination, commitment, discipline, and just pure rigor. Just the willingness to participate. So <laughs> we'll get to that. But on the other side comes a lot of rewards and a lot of freedom, right? Which is the reason why I continue to invest in real estate. And we'll get there for you as well. Let's talk about raising fifty million dollars. You've come up with a system out of this. Well, tell it, tell the way you want to tell it. Tell us about raising $50 million and what it means to become a professional capital raiser as you have. Sure. So, you know, basically my first capital raise, I did what most people think they should do. And which is basically go out and try to convince people that they know to invest with them. And even if they have some level of like savviness, they hear no like, and trust. And so like, okay, my friends and family know, like, and trust me, I can go out and present to them. And that's what I did and kind of fell on my face. But that experience made me recognize that you have to have something far more robust in place than just simply like a 30 minute presentation. Mm -hmm. You have to have like a fully enhanced nurture system that's very scalable so that the percentage of people that move forward can be very small, but there's enough people involved in the transaction or the, the potential funnel that it's okay. And so after failing quite miserably on my first capital raise, I created, you know, I refer to as the AENC system, which is short for attract, educate, nurture, close, and then an online infrastructure to facilitate that. And so we have so many touch points, automations, email cadence, kind of just a very, very intense understanding of what people want, how to give it to them, when to follow up, when to prompt them to schedule a call, when to prompt them to attend a webinar, when to prompt them to fund. And to your point, yes, it works, right? So you know, we recently did a deal that wasn't even a real estate deal. It was a non-real estate deal. We raised almost $9 million in about 17 days. And that's very consequential. Um, but the part that's more important is that we probably did 10 phone calls to hmm. do that. And this is not for, I don't mean like one phone call to some institution or some family office that gave us 9 million. I'm talking about, we had 70 investors in a deal and we had about 10 of those investors request us to do a call. And it's not that we just found the least competent accredited investors in the world. <laughs> They're extremely competent. Right, right, right. Because <laughs> I'm right. like, really, only 10 yeah, of them phone calls? I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. Because I'm exactly. one of those guys who would who would have, I, all I did was text with you on that particular one. I know you happened to had 10 phone calls and at least three texts because I think you texted me three times. But, yeah. uh, but, but yes, so you had 10 phone calls, but you're right. It isn't just people who aren't savvy investors. Go ahead. Yeah, we just know exactly what to do to get in front of the dominoes and knock those dominoes down. So, you know, investing in the ATM business, which is what this was, there's concerns that we can predict. And we can predict this not because we're just super intelligent, but because we can hear what people are saying. We know what to listen to. So mm -hmm. if someone's concerned about the technology risk, we want to do a webinar or something about that. We want to do a podcast specifically about that. If someone's concerned about digital currencies, if someone's concerned about the, the cash flow and the amortization, in fact, that the ATMs depreciate, not just from a tax standpoint, but from a physical value standpoint, we know all these things are going to come up. So we create automated systems to kind of address those concerns and get out in front of them. Mm -hmm. And so it's just very, very powerful because in the event that we do get on a phone call with someone, they're super nurtured. They have the opportunity to learn more about me, more about the ATM business than anybody. It's just not done on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So by the time they get on the phone call, they just want to know, are you real? Like, do you actually exist in reality? And if so, awesome. That's great. Just wanted to see you face-to-face -face via Zoom or schedule a quick call with you. And now we're good to go. And this is a replicatable system that is not just about me and my superpowers, which are very, very limited, but we know, you know, how to identify our dream clients and create 
the infrastructure that they go, oh my gosh, like Hunter doesn't have any competitors. You know what I mean? Like to just super, super high buy-in, but it's, we're only looking for a very specific kind of person and other capital raisers out there looking for different people. And so they see those other people's sites and they go, oh my gosh, Chris doesn't have any competitors. I just want to do all my deals with him. And, and you know, that's how we set it up. You know, it's, it's a, I do have to compliment you. The beauty of, of it is I was able to see part of your video on the ATM deal and oh, yeah. it was actually really well done. And it really was laid out to knock down my questions. I mean, it was complete. I mean, your description of that, and I wish I could find a way for the listeners who are, you know, people who are watching this or listening to this to really understand what it means to get ahead of what the questions are. It's not, it wasn't just like a and a it wasn't just a, Hey, let me, you know, let me, you know, how they have those Q and A's on websites where they go, Oh, if you have any questions, go to our Q and A. And it was, it was kind of like that in that, you know, it really was trying to anticipate people's questions because you had heard them so often, but it was so well educated and informed. It was like, you were walking me down a path, a logical path that I would think from the investor side, not necessarily from the guy who was running the ATM side, right? Which is the difficulty, right? Which you want to answer is investors questions, right? Because as like things like, um, as an investor, one of my funny questions that people wonder why I care so much about is, and so what exact structure are you using to hold this in? Is it a joint venture? Is it a separate LLC? Is it part of a larger LLC? Like, I'm a real believer in like, tell me about the structure that is going to bind me to you mm -hmm. in this investment, because that's where my rights lay as an investor, right? Where some syndicators were like, oh, let me tell you about the apartment building and let me tell you about the rehab and let me tell you about the units. And I'm like, I wanna hear all that. I really, really do. But I also need to know how I'm protected as an investor. And if you can't answer how I'm protected as an investor, it's hard for me. I may know you and like you, but it's hard for me to trust you as somebody who has my interest at heart. Let me hand you a hundred thousand dollars. Totally. Right. I like, mean, look, everything you just said, I've never actually talked about this publicly before, but okay. uh, maybe this won't be that revelatory, but so if you can prepare yourself emotionally to fail, but create systems that are going to be set up very well, if you just blow it out of the water and are super successful, you're going to be in a great position, right? So when I went into my first capital raise, I was not prepared for it to fail. And so it almost ended my career because mm -hmm. I was so embarrassed and I wasn't prepared financially. I had to make some text messages and say, oh my gosh, like I went into this capital raise thinking I was going to raise a million dollars. I raised zero dollars. Couldn't have gone worse. I told you that I was going to be a real estate entrepreneur. I said I was moving to LA and I've got all these networks and, and it couldn't have gone worse. That was really challenging for me. But now what I'm starting to see is like the example you just gave, imagine that if you can accurately get in front of those questions and answer them, that it can create a fully automated capital raising business. Mm -hmm. Another example of that is like from a structural standpoint, the world of securities is very challenging to navigate from a compliance standpoint, but it usually doesn't matter because most people usually don't succeed at a super high level. Right, because it's like we can do this behind closed doors, and there's not enough people involved, and blah 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 blah. You're always really going to question, and if we ever got looked at, it's like, oh yeah, I know it's closer to this versus that. It's more of a joint yes. venture agreement. It's people you know, blah blah blah, versus an actual securities. Yes, right? exactly. So you got to set up your business so that you're emotionally prepared if you fail, but it's going to be great if you succeed. And completely, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. You know, fifty million dollars raised. We did things right from the get-go so that we didn't have to go back and later unwind a bunch of deals, which by the way, there are people that really attempt to do things right and later have to do that because it's very, very challenging. So I can actually when you're think hiring of a couple people who've run into that, who've actually have run, actually run into difficulties, who tried to set it up correctly and it didn't work and they had to unwind. Yeah. yeah it's ahead. a real headache. Yeah. So I, I interrupted you. No, I, I mean, apologize. look, there, you mentioned- sometimes it's not so easy. It takes determination. Of course it does. This is a very lucrative business where the predictability of wealth creation is extremely high, probably the highest in the world in any opportunity. So that's going to attract very savvy, sophisticated individuals. But the good news is if you're like me, you don't have to be savvy and sophisticated. It's not so complicated that you have to have a genius IQ to grasp it. Certainly helps if you do, if you do, but you don't have to, you can take a look around the people that are successful maybe excluding or including the most recent president of the United States, as an example, you can be <laughs> successful without being a genius. And I'm trying to take advantage of that to my best degree. 
Yeah, I love it, Hunter. I agree 100%. I mean, there are there are so many different types of people investing in real estate. Tons. There's yeah. the artists, there's the contractor, there's the engineer, there's the financier, there's the people person, there's the introvert. There's so many different types of people invest in real estate. It's clearly not based on what your personality is yes. or what your IQ is. Because I know a lot totally. of people invest in real estate and I'm all like, how do you manage to do this when I talk to you? I'm a little like, I don't see you following a straight line in your thinking. How did you get to manage? How'd you raise $3 million inside right. of your own portfolio? And I don't, I feel it sounds to me like you can't do a cause and effect statement. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. I apologize if I've ever hurt anybody's feelings. But the point is, is that even that person who might be a true, true artist can, raise, can be invested in real estate and be successful. Um, and that is one of the beauties of real estate in that it is approachable from my, I call it the mom and pops. The mom and pops like me can get into real estate and they can do well. And it, you know, it's not my IQ, honestly, and it's not my dazzling personality either that makes me the most successful in real estate. To double can back I make a comment about that real quick? Because I talk about one of these things in my yeah. book, A Moment of Realization. Yeah, so um, the reason I kind of mentioned the genius IQ thing, I think, as you know, a very influential person in my life, especially when it comes to real estate, one of those early people that I met is Jeremy Roll, who, if you haven't yet had him as a guest on the show, he's an yeah. excellent speaker and very knowledgeable and a Wharton grad, one of those genius IQ kind of guys. And you can know it within five seconds of talking to him. Um, he's very nice and is a great and is approachable person. But yes. the moment that he starts talking about something that he's knowledgeable about, you're like, okay, this is a different level of <laughs> intellect. Just fall. Yes, intellect. it is. No, it's, it's it's like it starts unrolling out of his brain like a data bank. Just and you're like, oh shoot, I couldn't even keep that data in my head. More or less, have as well organized as he does. Right, <laughs> right. Man. So when I met him, and you know, I thought, okay, I can be successful in this industry, but I clearly don't have the type of intellectual capacity as Jeremy, perhaps I'll be like a not as good version of Jeremy. That's still fine. Like he's doing quite well. So if I do a 10th of that, I'll be great. That was kind of my, my perspective. That's good. And, you, um, you know, I continued on in the sector and I remember one time I was in an SUV. I had been invited to kind of go on a property visit with some major players in the space. And this is well along the line of my career, but still it was an important moment for me. You know, I was with Someone And at the time, I think I had raised $10 million. Um, and I was with two people that had cumulatively raised 200 million. And I don't mean that they had a business. It's like them as a person, and maybe they have an assistant, and each of them had raised $100 million in this SUV. And there are so many realizations from that. But one of the realizations was that both of those people had such different personalities. They were both very special but like one was really outgoing is a great charismatic speaker. And the other one's like super nerdy and like, doesn't really want to talk to anyone. Both had had tremendous success in this industry. And at that moment, when I had only raised $10 million, I thought, I bet I can raise a hundred million dollars. Like they don't have, now that I saw the, the different personalities and how they play in the space, I thought, okay, maybe I have a, a role to play in this space. And now looking back on that, you know, as you mentioned, I've raised $50 million. So that story doesn't hit nearly as hard, but at the time it was just this big moment. Like, I think it's probably clear unless something catastrophic happens, I would likely be able to make that claim in probably a few short years. Mm -hmm. But if you're listening to this and you hear, and this is odd to say, but let's say you hear me and for whatever reason you check out and say that works for Hunter, but not for me. You know, that's why I talk about how hard it was to raise my first million dollars mm -hmm. because it couldn't have gone worse. And I had to scrap and get super scrappy despite being from a great family, despite being born in America, born, you know, born with the internet, being able to go whatever college I want to, whatever, et cetera. It was still challenging with all those advantages, but it, it was able to work if, cause I stuck with it. And now I think it's, um, you know, I want to point to your book and I want to point to your coursework because you you have seemed to have through the diligence through being scrappy, through your commitment, you've created a system that we know that works, that talks to investors successfully, because I've been able to take a peek at it and definitely talk to me from an investor's point of view. You're clearly in front of what people need to understand. You just did a $9 million raise where you were able to do 10 phone calls and yet bring in 70 different people who trust, knew, trust you, knew you, liked you, and liked the opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's an amazing amount of uh, credibility to be able to have only 10 phone calls and raise money from 70 people. Um, 
let's talk about the the teaching and the book like why do teaching in a book when you've got i mean you've got a successful system going you're clearly good at it i know you're passionate about it because i've seen you talk on your videos why do a book and a coursework on top of that oh my gosh that's such a good question and i actually man it's been a while since i've talked about this to someone like like yourself that will really know where i'm going with this so when I started in my career and, and going back to like the Jeremy, like Jeremy's an influential person in my life today, for sure. We actually have a call after this in like 20 minutes. But <laughs> when we entered that sector, it was in the wake of the big implosion of real estate gurus, like the first iteration of real estate gurus, because there had never been a time in the United States where real estate prices had shot up in that same capacity, which creates all this attention, which creates a bunch of fix and flip coaches that you give them 50 grand. They've never, they've never flipped a house in their life and they give you a template and you try to implement it and maybe you get a foreclosure. I mean, it's like just a complete nightmare of false education taught by people who don't have a significant background in the industry. Okay. And so when I saw that, I was like, I will never do that because mm -hmm. if you pay for coaching, why would anyone want to teach what they know, especially in the sector that's so lucrative? Why would anyone give away their secrets? And that, to be honest with you, I totally get where I was coming from at the time and why my mentors were talking to me in that capacity and saying, never go that route. But they inadvertently cost me probably seven years of my growth curve. Mm -hmm. They probably... You know, I would have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to know what I know now, seven years ago. Um, it was very difficult to figure out who to trust back then because the model hadn't really started working. But the real reason that I got into the space of coaching, especially paid coaching of any kind, is in, in part because of that. Because if you are 80% good in this industry, you're in a bad position. You're in a scary situation, especially when it comes to what we were talking about previously with compliance and such. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is I believe that I'm a, a very good investor when it comes to due diligence, when it comes to tying in economics with an investment thesis, it's, I would say I'm in the very good category when it comes to explaining the marketing side of things, when it, when it comes to explaining and motivating people to take action, I think that I can be one of the best. And, and that is a real serious claim. That's a serious claim because make. actually I happen to know how strong you are on the data geek side. So, <laughs> so that's actually, it's, it's actually not only, that's a really serious claim. Go it's for a it. serious claim and it's embarrassing to say, but I've got to try to make that claim because if not, why would I do that? Okay. So just to, just to provide some context, I record, I wrote my book and I put my whole life's work into my book and you can get it for free. I'll pay for the shipping. It's $8 at raisingcapitalforrealestate.com. If you go right. and you start to read that book, you'll recognize why I took it, like how I took it so seriously. I put everything I knew, the apps, the strategies, the email templates, every single thing I know is in that book. And the only possible reason that I would put that level of attention to detail is because I thought maybe this will be one of the best books about raising capital. And, and I'm confident that is the case. And so that that's kind of like that Kobe Bryant versus Kanye West type of mentality where it's like, you got to actually believe like another example is once I wrote the book, I recorded the audiobook where I personally narrated it. That tick, I sent my narrator 16 hours of me making mistakes, rereading sentences over and over again. He edited it when he edited it all down. The audiobook is five and a half hours. Oh my God. <laughs> I did it in two days. I did that nonsense for two days. So why the heck would I ever go through that pain unless I thought it could really make an impact on people's lives? Right. So like I have this competitive part of my personality, but it reflects itself in what kind of impact can I have on other people's lives, which is a very cool thing. Mm -hmm. So that's why, because I so want to make an impact in the industry. Yeah, I was gonna say you just slipped it out. You want to make an impact on the industry, and exactly. and you said that, that that your original some some of your original mentors were discouraging you from sharing the data, and yet I I you know I am of such an opposite point of view where it's like share the data all you want because when it comes down to the moment of them implementing something, they're still gonna need a mentor. They're still gonna need a guidance. They're still gonna need somebody to step in there to make all the wets pull together and let them take action. Because I mean, as a, as a mentor myself for years, right? This has been my experience. Like you give away the whole recipe 
but it doesn't really, doesn't really, it's not really, I mean, maybe 3% of the people who listen to you, 2% of the people who listen to you would be able to just implement it without doubling back to you and saying, okay, I heard you say this, this, and this, but I don't get this piece and that piece. And that breaks my chain and I can't finish this. I need totally. those pieces. So I guess I, I almost want to, I can understand where did, where did, how did it cost you those years to listen to them? And now here you are. Oh man. So, I mean, really the, the challenge with that and what I have found, it was so surprising to me was in the wake of all of this, I thought no matter what, I will never do paid coaching stuff because that's like what people that don't know what they're doing do quote gurus, et cetera. Okay. And again, I, that's nothing against the people that kind of taught me that. But as I started to get into the world of paid coaching masterminds, et cetera, what I started to see is my book, which is like $8. If I were to sell that book for like a hundred grand, people would get crazy amounts of value because mm -hmm. they would start to, they would start to do nothing but try to get that hundred grand back. That's right. Right. So like in the world of coaching, there's kind of different levels. So my book is tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that is, I'm giving you the absolute playbook. It's eight bucks. It's the tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. And then we have a mastermind, which is very expensive. It's like a five figure type of mastermind, but that's a do it with you. That's right. And what we see is that I sold probably 10,000 books, somewhere 10,000 books. But when we get those thank you notes, when we get those thank you notes from the wives, but you, oh my gosh, you have changed my business. Like we are raising millions of dollars. It's all from people that made a huge commitment financially. I wish there was a way to hack it. Trust me, I tried with my book. Yeah, no, there's, the, there's the what to do that. and then there's the how to implement it. And the how to implement it is so personal. Yes. Right? I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher at heart. Why do why I make my money from my real estate profession, my real estate investments? I do not make my money from my mentorship. I'm just saying, right? And I only and I limit my mentorship because it I can't interrupt with my biggest why, which is to be home for my child and to continue to to take care of it. I'm the financial provider for my family. So I provide for my family financially. I take care of my child and I do the mentorship program because of the capacity to make a change and to help people. Like, Love it. like what you talked about, right? I, I know that about you. And so, but I wanted to let you put your own words in there. Um, without the how, what is great and it's a wonderful checklist and it makes a big difference. But without the, how do I implement it? And it's the I part. I'm an introvert. I'm an artist. I'm a, I'm an extrovert. I, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I get numbers. I don't get people. I do get people. I don't get enough. The how do I do it is where the mentorship has to come in. And then it can be this powerful vehicle for how you or I as an individual actually do what I've been told. The what. Totally. Yeah. And I know that you've had success as well in the same realm. And Hopefully. I'm sure that you get those same kind of thank yous where if you just simply released all the information, I know that you have, and my wife, by the way, was in Christina is that if anyone is interested, it is like a total no brainer, complete steal. The networking component alone is just totally worth it. So go and sign up for her thing. Like no questions asked, but the, if you had simply just given that out for free on the internet, it can, sometimes it has the tendency to go bump, bump, bump and hit the ground yeah. because people think, Oh no, I got it. I'll go do it. But it doesn't hurt them enough. If it hurts just a little bit, then they take action and then they start to see actual results. They, well, they take it seriously. They yes. commit to it. They commit to it up front. I mean, I hate to say it, but the part of the price point is getting people to commit. Totally. Clearly, if you've committed this price point, you're going to, I can't, I can't help you if you don't show up. Totally. <laughs> and if you don't pay, there's a really good chance you won't show up. I'm just yeah. saying. I talk about this in my book, actually. I try to like Please, hack this. It's very difficult to do it, but like, I'll give you an example. When people go to networking events, you know, it's like 30 bucks or 20 bucks or something like that, go to network event. Back when we used to have, I'm sure they're going to be coming out now soon, but people make the mistake of thinking 20 bucks, the value I've got my money back, basically. The issue is that this space has the potential to create millions of dollars for you and your family. So in the time that you're going to a networking event, trying to get $30, you're thinking about it in the wrong direction. Like you should be getting thousands of dollars of value anytime you go anywhere because that's what's at stake. So in my book, I try to like hack this. It doesn't work all the time, but it's super, super impactful to think, you know, what 
kind of concept could I learn that'll give me two grand? What relationship can I create that'll give me two grand? What, whose phone number, what attorney contact, what book can I read that'll give me a value of $2,000? If I get 5,000 or five of those $2,000 values, I have a great night. So going in with that mentality, like you're down 10 grand is just so, so powerful because the $30 is inconsequential in the space. You should rather have stayed home and stared at the floor and try to come up with something that's impactful. And that's not derogatory. I actually mean it literally. Sitting and staring at the floor are some of the best ways that you can change your business because you'll have those ideas of, oh my gosh, I should create this ebook. I should create this webinar. I should create this concept. We should do this deal. And um, now I'm getting excited, but I think you get where yeah, I'm going. And that. I'm going to line up my network because I'm going to find, I'm going to figure out that these three people are the top people inside my network that are going to be perfect for this next thing that I want to create. And exactly. those, are my, and I need to take this 15 minutes it takes to sort through all my contacts to find those three people. And that's an incredibly powerful 15 minutes because I now have created the people I need to contact to create the team to move this ficker forward. Love it. <laughs> right. And that 15 minutes. So, so, and, and then of course, all those contexts are created by going to networking meetings that you paid $30 at, and now you're going to be able to do a hundred thousand dollar deal because you invested the time, not the $30 at the door, but the time in creating yourself. And this to me is all leadership skills, right? This is what we're talking about. This commitment to investing the time, the commitment to creating the network, the commitment to being able to understand per people on a personal basis so that you can know what their their win and their passion is and when it me meets your win and your passion or somebody else that you know. It's the willingness, to, you said this earlier, the willingness to fail, but to line everything up to be successful. And to me, that's, that is the backbone of leadership. Being a leader is not because I'm the smartest or the fastest or the, or the, the, uh, the strongest. I, I, I find it funny to me that leadership is not defined by those traits. Leadership to me is defined by willing to be a leader. <laughs> if you're willing to be a leader and you're willing to make the decisions and you're willing to apply your mind and your skills to making sound decisions and then being willing to be wrong and then be accountable to being wrong is sometimes the biggest parts of being a leader is the willingness to be wrong, the willingness to fail is part of what makes a leader successful. Not that you're setting yourself up to fail. Actually, you're spending a lot of time setting yourself up to not fail. So I love that you that you talked on that. Okay, so let me, speaking of failing, let's double back to the other half of this, of this conversation because I only have you for 10 more minutes. Mm -hmm. So real estate is an amazing way to create wealth and it truly works. You're a testament to that. Jeremy is, I am. The, we know hundreds, literally hundreds of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people who have made and have success in real estate, have procured their retirement, have found satisfaction, have found a sense of life's purpose, have paid for their college education, their kids' college education, have raised their kids all through the using the vehicle of real estate. It is financially successful, period. That is true. But it can also be a pain. <laughs> it can really test you and challenge you and you need to be willing to fail in order to be willing to succeed. So let's talk about one of your biggest failures. Yeah, man, this is, you know, I can talk about this now because we were able to resolve the matter in a way that I'm proud of, but it Good. is just, it's really a scar, right? Okay. So before I even get into it, it's like, if you're in the space and you're thinking about pursuing some of these things about going out in public and building a platform and creating an ebook and telling your story and talking about your failures, I just had someone talk to me and ask a question, you know, should I share this story? And he shared a story, which I thought was very appropriate to share, but because of this key moment, which is you want to share your scars, not your wounds. And so this no longer is a wound of yeah. mine. It's a scar, but there was yeah. a time where I couldn't talk about it because it yeah. was an ongoing thing that I was like, it wasn't ready to be talked about in this light. It's perfect. That's a really good description. Again, yeah. there's a difference between a scar and a wound. And sometimes wounds you don't want to share because the, the, it's not finished inside of you or it's not finished in the world. Correct. It finished because you have to learn your lesson from it. In order to learn your lessons from yes. it, it needs to be finished. That's so, it's a great way of saying it. And I haven't thought about it, but that is why, because what's going on. If you're just having a panic attack, it's not like you don't need to go out into the world and be like, I'm freaking out. It's like, okay, cool. Here's my hundred grand. No, that's not going to work. But um, I'll, I'll tell you kind of my, tell me. The, the, something painful that we had to go through was as I started, like this is 2014. So you can kind of imagine where I was, you know, getting some momentum, starting to have some success, raising capital, et cetera. Um, I started to think that there was a huge opportunity in the non-performing note space, which there it was and is. And 
I, in short, I basically drastically underestimated the volatility of that asset class and mm -hmm. the potential sample size that you need to make those numbers work. Right. So in that space, you know, it's not a cash flowing asset. You're buying, imagine if you were to buy 25 non-performing notes, it's like buying a 25 unit apartment complex where no one's paying rent mm -hmm. and you can get some of them to work out and some of them won't, et cetera. But we didn't buy enough. You know, the numbers are going to work out like this, but it's like, if you flip a coin, it's not going to be heads or tails 50, 50, right? It's going to be a hundred percent heads if you flip it once or tails, right? So it's very, very binary. And when you flip it three or four or five times, yeah, you're starting to get some semblance of sample size, but you can also flip it 16 times in a row and get heads hundred percent of the time as well. So of course I'm like oversimplifying this, but you are, but I we get didn't leave enough room for the same. We thought we were playing it small to have a proof of concept to then scale, right? And so what ended up happening was it was just so much work and there was almost nothing to gain very short into the deal. We quickly recognized this, num this deal is not gonna hit a preferred return and all of our compensation was back-ended. So then it became just a, from a moral obligation standpoint, are we gonna spend the time to ensure that our investors get their money back? And that, by the way, is a very important lesson. If you are like me and are in, inclined to create an incentive structure that's such a no-brainer that you only get paid if things go really well, it's really important that you take upfront fees and ongoing management fees because if you ever get in a situation like this, which if you do a lot of deals, you eventually will, you want to be able to justify to your spouse that you need to make this right and that you can put food on the table by making it right. Okay. So I know it's, it's in my intuition not to do something like that. People say, smash the acquisition fees down as low as you can, remove asset management fees. No, you know, that only works if you're confident the deal is going to perform. Because at that point in the deal, we had to rely on my partner and I's moral obligation, which is you do not want to put yourself in that position, right? It is. It's a so, moral obligation, which is very tiring to the soul. Exactly. You can do it. You can exactly. do it. Even very good people can have their vision clouded by those types of incentives. So what ended up happening was worse than that. You know, we had to come out of pocket to make investors whole. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely, uh, you know, and I mean significantly. And we did. We made that decision. We thought we don't want to have this reputation. We want people to know that we did everything we can, including any hurting us a bit. You know, not only deferring our co-invest, but also coming out of pocket, et cetera. And we were able to wind that deal down and achieve that goal, which was a goal that we figured out in a three-year fund. We figured out in six months that that was going to end up being the goal. Wow. And it is painful to talk about even. That does take a lot. I think I, I would say that the, I've, I've always paid my investors off and whole. And the biggest single check I've ever written to make an investor whole is $350,000. Wow. That's a big ass check. <laughs> See, that's Sorry. after tax dollars, <laughs> right? Saying. It's not just like you can just move some money around. It's like you came, the oh. money went from your bank account to someone else's. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a chunk. I mean, the, and the, and the pure, and it purely is integrity. It's a hundred percent character and integrity that has you write that check. And it is, it is, it's your desire to stay in the field. It's your desire to protect your brand in the field. It's the desire to continue to be a leader in the field and to be seen and respected as a leader. Right? These are the personal motivations, right? Um, it's the desire to be a good person. Yeah, that's in there too. I'm not saying it's not in there. It is in there, but it, it is, it's, it really is like, you really have to question your game and your position in the field and your position with yourself, right? To say, am I going to write this check or not? Even if you have the cash in the bank, right? And you don't have to scroll around or even figure that out. I, I, you know, I've had conversations, many conversations with people who are like, oh, but it's the investor's money. They're the one who took the risk. And I'm like, no, <laughs> yeah, we sign a piece of paper that says that we absorb the risk as an investor because I'm an investor as well as right, a professional in the field, as you are, you're an investor and a professional in the field, right? And so you can see both sides of the coin. Yeah, I signed that paperwork that signed away my, my, you know, my rights to say that, hey, I didn't know this was risky. But if you want to keep performing in the field and you want me to keep trusting you and you want to be able to keep your, your space, this relationship whole, you got to make me whole or at least, at least try. Yeah. And, and that's what we did. 
you know, and I mean, I know we have to run in a second, but I, I want to kind of, whenever those things happen, you want to take some time to emotionally recover from that stuff, but it's really important. That's the only time that you can actually learn any lessons. So it's very difficult for me to do deals. I'm actually happy to do deals. Now this is less of a, a thing, but there was a time in let's say 2014, 2015, where there was people out there advocating that you only work with people that were in the business through the recession. Mm -hmm. And I didn't take that approach, mm -hmm. but you need to have some entrepreneurial scars. You need to mm -hmm. know what it's like to be kicked in the gut or you just don't learn anything. So, you know, if you have a background in sports, for example, you don't really learn anything if you're just mowing down the competitors, but that time that you lose, all of us remember those times. We never remember the time that we won by 40. So you got to take a moment, call your partner and have a meeting or several meetings about what went wrong, what you could have done better. And, you know, there was a lot of important lessons that we learned, but you know, the thing that I learned was that Tell I me. never wanted to be the up. operator. I only want to work with tenants that are signing up to do business with me. And I want to only be involved in commercial. Mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot of people that have a lot of success in residential. And I know that you're one of those people, but for my personality, the people that I want to deal with, the, the types of just the, the data that I found, mm -hmm. I want to be in the 15 to $50 million purchase range and dealing with operators that stand to gain millions of people, millions of dollars. So the, the key there, and I just want to add one thing. Um, oh, take the, your time. The smaller the asset class, you can get some really great deals on a proportional basis buying, let's say $30,000 properties. But like the people, your investment is limited by its weakest link. So if your property manager stands to make $50 a month and the likelihood that he may claim that an air conditioning machine doesn't work to scrape out an extra thousand dollars a year here and there, that can ruin your whole investment on a gross dollars basis. So I want to invest with it. Number one, I want to invest in securities as a passive investor, which have significant implications in terms of the legal stuff, but also if they lie, they can go to prison. If they do it right, they can make 10 million bucks. That's going to attract the kind of caliber of individual that I think my hundred grand might be worth investing with and relying on. Really well said, really Thanks. well said. No, because it is boils down to my hundred grand. I'm putting my, as an investor, right? From my side, as an investor. Um, I like that. I like that description. Um, yeah, I do deal with residential, but you're right. When it comes to syndication and I'm going to hand a hundred grand over to somebody else. Yeah, that's going to be really important. And I like the, the accountability on both sides. Like they need to be able to make a, several millions and be excited about that. And if they frick it up through negligence or through a fraud, their ass is going to go to prison. Totally. Right? Totally. And that is a game that draws people who are capable of performing under that level of heat. Exactly. It's not just the accountability. It's the capacity to perform. Okay, we have literally two minutes left for me to hear why do all of this stuff if it's so tough? What is your why in breaking through to your financial freedom? I'll keep it brief because I know we have to run. But um, for me, it was always about you know, financial freedom. I think about this in a very specific way. I have a background as a poker player, and that's not a significant background, but it was like a summer job when I was in college and didn't want to have a boss. And that's very indicative of my personality in the sense that if I was like a, a video game, player you know you go into play like you pick your character and like this goes strong this guy's fast okay so my like freedom index is like smashed all the way forward maybe i'll lose out on some other points but the freedom money to me is freedom points and also influence points and so i think of it kind of like poker chips it's the amount of fun and lack of concern and lack of the emotional stress that comes along with money, which I, by the way, don't know very much about. Like I said, like I was very, I was born in a very fortunate situation, but I know what I have seen over and over again, what really challenged. And by the way, this does include my family in terms of when things are going haywire in terms of finances, there's pretty much no way to quickly recover emotionally. Like it's like drowning type of situation. And if you want to learn more about that, you can Google how to lose money and Google my name. And you're going to hear a story, the likes of which you'll probably never believe about something that happened to my grandfather. But um, he was involved in one of the largest bankruptcies in the history of Tennessee, by the way, I'll give you a little teaser. Okay. Um, that ripples through. It's very difficult to overcome that issue. And by the way, if you can overcome that issue, everything else starts to become a lot less challenging. And I'll give you a silly little example 
because I am not super knowledgeable about having a family because it's me and my wife. So I'm not trying to give people advice about how to run their family because I'm not in a position to do that. But I, I started to get the sense like we are going through that path of, you know, starting to have kids. That's going to be, that's like our next step. And we have a little puppy right now, which is a great kind of intermediary step. And both her and I are entrepreneurs and we both work quite hard and at a frantic pace. And so we wanted to be able to hire a dog walker to come and take our puppy out once a week because we want to give our puppy a good life. We want her to see the other dogs. She's a, like a very friendly dog. She wants to go out. She wants to see Sherman Oaks, et cetera. And this dog walker, you know, it's like 50 bucks, you know, to go out and spend the day with the dog. And it gives her a great life. Like she comes back, she's exhausted. Everyone, they take pictures of her. She gets a report card. Like it's a real like tier one, one percenter type of dog walking experience. But you know, whatever that is, $3,500 a year, that's a lot of money. And we're only in a position to provide her with that because of what she and I do. And so it would be so sad and challenging and create real problems between my wife and I, if we didn't have the opportunity to have that very <laughs> elite kind of dog walking experience, because we would be like, we owe it to her. We owe it. We want to give her this. And so to me, all of this work, this is a silly example because we only have a dog. We don't have a kid yet, but I start to recognize multiply everything by a hundred or a thousand or a hundred thousand. And now we're getting into real serious, you know, the, the stress, the implications, the, the college, all that stuff, which can ripple through into your relationship. So I know that was a long winded example and probably one that people are snickering about. Cause it's like, this kid doesn't know anything about raising a family. And that's my point. That's, that's your what point. Made the that is your point. Your point is, is that your blooming dog is giving you this window into how yes. financial, how important financials are to freedom. And to me, it's almost integrity the capacity to take care of your dog or your kids the way that you want to, the way that you feel is the best quality because that's what your heart pulls for. And that's what your financial freedom gives you. 100%. Hunter, thank you so very much. Why don't you tell people again how they can get a hold of you and we'll close the show out. Sure. So um, if you want to check out my book, it's raisingcapitalforrealestate.com. Plus we have a webinar that's coming up and yes, it's live depending on when this is released, but it's live. It's going to be live. It's raisingcapitalforrealestate.com forward slash never scramble. And it's literally 110 slides of capital raising faucet hydrant drinking to the dome. So I will see you there. <laughs> never. And so raising capital for real estate forward slash never dash scramble. scramble. Awesome. Hunter, thank you so very much. This is Christina Suter with the Real Estate Breakthrough Show. Tune in next week for more. You can find me on uh, YouTube, Roku TV, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and a variety of other platforms. Tune in next week. Thanks again.